Going in Second Timothy this morning. Chapter three. As we've been moving through this second letter of Paul to Timothy, I've been greatly impressed by it in my in my study. I was speaking with Joe this morning. I feel like I've been living in Second Timothy in these last months. In the first portion of chapter 3, we had this this alarm sounded. Mark these days, realize this, said the Apostle to Timothy in the last days. Difficult times will come. Some versions say perilous. Times will come. And we've seen that the reason the times are perilous is because of the people that are alive that have these certain characteristics and attitudes within them make the times perilous. We saw they would be lovers of money, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, but not lovers of God. And then a full list of characteristics and attitudes are listed there that fill it out. And then we saw in the last sermon, perhaps the most recent sermon, the alarming thing about that is they will also be within the church. He says in verse 5, holding a form of godliness, although they've denied the power. So the, the visible church, Christendom at large, everywhere <clears throat> is populated with these same ones who have these attitudes and these characteristics. He says, avoid such men as these, and they are destructive. They prey on the weak. He says they enter into households and prey on uh, weak women weighed down with various sins. And then he goes on to, to name two individuals and uses them as illustrations of that, Janus and Jambres. He says, as they opposed Moses, they, these men also opposed the truth. Those two fellows were magicians in Moses' day. In the days of his uh, appearing in the court of Pharaoh, Janus and Jambres opposed and Verse 9 ends, they will not make further progress. Their folly will be evident to all. In Janus and Jambres, it was that way with them. They didn't make further progress. You know, they, um, they could turn a stick into a snake, apparently. But Aaron's snake ate their snake. And apparently, they were able to duplicate Nile River made into blood, turned into blood. Um, they were able to make some frogs come out of the river. Couldn't get rid of the frogs. Had to appeal to Moses for that. In the end, they could not make gnats. And um, they could not deal with the boils. They said that's the finger of God and, in, and they couldn't stand before Moses because of the boils. So their folly was made evident to all. And you know, I said in that sermon that the counterfeit is always an attack on the truth because it, it has as its design to undervalue and de- to devalue the truth. So those men, Janus and Jambres, with their fake counterfeit miracles, at the end of every one of those occasions, it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. You have the genuine, you have the counterfeit thrown up. We can do that just like this guy can, Moses. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But in the end, their folly was not, their folly was obvious to all, and they were unable to make further progress. So, in our portion today, taking up in verse 10, there are three words in these next five or six verses that stand out in my mind for the purpose of this sermon more than others. Continue, followed, and convinced. 
And those will make up the headings of the sermon this morning. Let's read in verse 10. But you, but you, Timothy, followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings. Such has happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The last part of verse 15 we'll handle in a separate sermon, and so we'll be stopping in the mid part of verse 15. So in verse 10, but you followed. In verse 14, you, however, continue in. And also in verse 14, you have learned and become convinced. So all of this is in contrast to the first nine verses, which were um, largely negative surrounding these perilous times. He says, continue in verse 14. You, however, continue in the things that you've learned. Remain there. That's what continue means. Remain there. And in the first letter to Timothy, Paul had told him, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching and persist in this. For by so doing, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Persist in this is the little phrase I'm capitalizing on right here. It means continue. Persist in it. To the Colossian church, he says, if you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. It sounds very similar to what Dan was sharing in his contribution there. You've got to finish the race. You've got to continue in it doesn't do any good to stop and then drop out. I've got to finish. Paul told the Romans in chapter 2 and verse 7, to those who by patience in well-doing, they seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Patience in well-doing. And... Um, the letter there to the Hebrews in chapter 3 and verse 14. We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You've got to finish. You've got to continue. Paul is urging Timothy to continue on. Now over and against that, I, I believe, surely has got to be apostasy. Not continuing, but Denying the faith, going back, having enough of it. I've had enough of this. I'm going back. I'm turning away from it. That would be apostasy. That would be the exact opposite of continuance. It's not finishing the race, your course, the fight, all of those things that were shared with us earlier. John in his first letter said they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain they were not of us. Surely apostasy, at least, is contained in that verse. And Paul, Paul even went so far as to say to the Corinthians, there must be divisions, factions among you in order to that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. They might appear, those that are genuine. If there aren't any divisions, factions that way, then you never have an, ex an exposure of those that are false. 
those that don't continue. They go on undetected, but then a division comes, and at least, if there's anything positive that comes of it, one thing is that which is false and not genuine is proven. So he, he tells Timothy to continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of. Now we'll come back to this verse a little bit later. But I said the second was, but you followed. You followed. These others didn't, but you did. You followed. You embraced. You conformed to some things. And, and the aged Apostle Paul, you know, Timothy, we understand to be young at this point, And he puts forward his own life for Timothy to imitate. Now, I'm thankful for other men, godly men, other pastors, godly pastors that have had such a formative influence in my life and whose examples are of such that they're worthy of imitation. And you ought to be thankful to God in the same way because they're a tremendous blessing In the past, I've been greatly humbled by the fact that God has put such men in my life, here, there, everywhere, in the circles that we travel, and the churches that we're a part of. He says to Timothy, you followed my teaching. Now, those that are Greek scholars and, and all, they tell me that each one of these in this list right here is accented with the word my, my conduct, my purpose, my faith is how it would read, I guess. And it adds to this idea of imitating Paul's life for Timothy. He says, you followed my teaching. That is, you've learned these things. So here you have doctrine and theology and principles and applications, all of that. Timothy benefited from Paul's teaching. Uh, You and I are benefiting from it today, still, (laughs) Paul's teaching. And have been for a while. But in the first letter, Paul told Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 6, being constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. And again, the Greek guys tell me this is a perfect tense, means that you have been following and will continue to follow. It's ongoing, which adds to my first heading on continuance. You followed my teaching. You have been following it, says the Apostle. In the first chapter, we saw that verse in verse 13. Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me. So it's good to follow when you have someone like Paul to be a a leader for a young man like Timothy. And you and I, others, ought to appreciate the leadership that we have experienced and do experience. So you followed my teaching. But then he says you followed my conduct. My teaching and my conduct. So you have the two, they go together. What is teaching without conduct? What is teaching worth if the life doesn't exemplify that which is being taught? It's not worth much, is it? My example, my manner of life, my manner of behaving, you followed that. And it's human nature to be more likely to be influenced by a person's example than by their teaching. And maybe sometimes you've heard someone say, do what I say and not as I do. <laughs> Have you heard that? What they're saying is, my example isn't following what I'm telling you to do here, but you need to do it anyway. <laughs> my example's poor. Well, this is the opposite of that. This is do like I say and like I do, which is very beneficial. 
So here's a sobering question. What commentary am I writing with my life today? And that's um, it's sobering for us as parents, especially with little ones at home, and it's sobering for me as a pastor. What kind of commentary am I writing with my life today? Words come easy, but to back them up with a life, that's a lot different. Much more challenging. To the Thessalonians, Paul said, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. And he even went so far as to say, we offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. Now, we would tend to read those words and say, that sounds awful egotistical to me. Here I am putting myself forward as an example, but it was apostolic authority their life as an example to a church that, w- that arose out of a pagan society. So we ought to thank God every, for every example given to us that guides our way that we can follow like a compass um, um, among men who teach and who exemplify their teaching. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, said Paul to the Corinthians. And at the very end of Hebrews in chapter 13, he says, Remember your leaders and those who spoke the word of God to you and considering the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith. So there's an example. Matthew Henry says, Paul did not pull down by his living what he built up by his preaching. That's pretty easy to do. You could take a, life, a, a lifetime ministry in, in the pulpit and by scandal destroy it all in a moment. It happens everywhere. Pull down by the living what has been built up by preaching. So he says, you followed my teaching and my conduct. You followed my purpose. That would be what is aimed for, my proposals, my plans. You followed my faith. Faith is moral conviction. It's persuasion. It's confidence in God. Alexander McLaren said, faith is the hand that grasps. And uh, that's a good illustration right there, I think. The hand that grasps. If it doesn't grasp by faith, if the heart doesn't grasp by faith, what is it? It's mere theology. It's head knowledge. That's all that it can be. You followed my patience. I guess we're to understand this as patience with difficult and disappointing people. Patience. Webster in the dictionary says he has this definition for patience. He says, it's a calm temper which suffers evils without murmuring or discontent. Now, if you think about... um, someone who's prone to get angry quickly, we say he's got a short fuse. Right? You've got to be careful what you say to him. It doesn't take much for him to go off. He's got a short fuse. This word patience right here is just the opposite of that. Think of yourself as a bomb and you've got a long fuse. You don't light it and it goes off instantly. You you all have probably seen that with firecrackers or something. That's one of the dangers of them. Sometimes you light them and those things go off quick. But here you can think of it in this line, this way, here's a bomb and it's me, I could go off, but I've got this long fuse. (laughs) There's plenty of opportunity to snuff it out there before it ever goes off. That's how, that's patience here. We need to be like that. It needs to, there needs to be a, a lot, it takes a lot before I get upset. 
That's what it needs to be when we talk about patience. A calm temper. Um, I've laughingly, jokingly said to my wife sometimes, here's this person, I've got one nerve left and they're getting on it. (laughs) That's kind of the opposite of patience. Not easily offended or provoked. Then he says, you followed my love. That's love to God and love to people, surely. Self-explanatory, you followed my perseverance. Now, this is different than patience because this is endurance in difficult circumstances. The one is endurance, patience with difficult people. Endurance is patience in difficult circumstances. You followed that. And Paul sure, sure had his share of difficult circumstances, troubling circumstances. Perseverance is enduring in that. And we sure need that. The Bible is full of endurance exhortations. Spurgeon in his wit said this, by perseverance the snail reached the ark. (laughs) Little quips like that make it really easy for my weak mind to understand concepts like this. You can picture this snail. I'll get there, I'll get there. (laughs) So we need this kind of perseverance in difficult, troubling circumstances as well as patience with difficult and disappointing people. Continue and followed. You followed. Lastly, conviction. I said we'd fall back and hit verse 14. Again, you, however, continued in the things you have learned and become convinced of. And that's the word I'm capitalizing on right now. Convinced, that's conviction. You're convinced of it. Fully persuaded is what it means there. And to learn things is not enough. It would not be enough if they were things you have just learned. That's with the head. And conviction is in the heart. And it's conviction through the Holy Spirit that transforms the life. And learning being in the head is not able to do that. The Holy Spirit works the learning in the heart to change the heart into conviction. Now conviction, that motivates a person. The learning without the conviction is mere theology. So in the original language, conviction means to be personally assured of, and it's the word that we get faith from, because saving faith is that. I'm personally assured that what Christ did was for me, and He's able to save my soul and I can cast my all on Him. That's a conviction rather than simply mouthing something that we've been taught. And we have our heads full of it, but not our heart. Saving faith, conviction. Our Gospel came to you not only in word, but in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Now, we tend to look at that and we say conviction of sin. We say so-and-so is under conviction of sin. Well, usually what we mean by that is they're troubled in their conscience over the bad things they've done. We say they're under conviction of sin, but this word in a broader way means they're convinced of something. And what are they convinced of? They're convinced what they did was wrong in the sight of God. They're conviction of sin. When the Bible is preached and it comes in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, it's the same word that's used for faith right there. We are fully persuaded in our heart and not just in our head that the things that are being said are real. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's power. There's power in that to change us, to change the life. So how was he convinced? How was he convicted? How did his learning become conviction? 
Paul says, knowing from whom you have learned them. So the teachers that taught Timothy, those teachings were used by the Holy Spirit to produce conviction within him. There was apostolic authority behind his teaching. He learned these things from an apostle, the Apostle Paul. That would be, there would be some tendency to make convictions out of those things that he learned there because of that. There was some pastoral authority in it. Uh, If we understand the history involved here, Paul was instrumental in Timothy's own conversion. And he was also instrumental in his ordination and his commission, all of those things. So there's some pastoral authority in these things. So he learned them and is convinced. And then some parental authority, I have to believe as well. He says in verse 15, from childhood you've known the sacred writings. Now we understand in the early chapters of these letters to Timothy, his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, were responsible for teaching him and did teach him, his mother and his grandmother. So he's got that authority as well to help formulate these convictions. A mother and a grandmother. Now, we ought not to undervalue those teachings from parents. The mother with the little one homeschooling or bouncing them on their knee and singing them songs or teaching them, those are not small things. They're formulative. As we have in the text today, I believe that's how we're to understand that. Not just a mother, but a grandmother as well. Here's a a humorous little boy's description of a grandmother. He says in one sentence, a grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own, so she loves everybody else's. But here was Timothy's grandmother and his mother responsible for teaching him from his childhood these sacred writings and these these scriptures. So Timothy is a prime example of how a young life can be greatly influenced by a grandmother, especially if she's a godly woman. And it's the scriptures that are taught here, which are very valuable. Sacred, holy, authoritative. He says, from childhood you've known. Now the capacity for children to learn is intense. It's immense. The Jesuits used to say, give me a boy until he's seven and I'll give you the man. The early years, that's when we ought to be pumping in these things to our children. Bible stories and and, um, teaching them the sacred scriptures. These are valuable lessons. Someone said you can bend a sapling over and over time it'll grow that way, but you can never bend a full-grown tree. Early is the admonition there. Their sacred writings. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I want to give you a quote from John Wesley here. It was impacting to me as I read it. He said this, I am a creature of a brief day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit coming from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf. A few moments from now, I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. How to land safe, how to land safe on that happy shore God Himself has condescended to teach the way. He's written it down in a book. 
Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let, be, let me be a man of one book. Here then I am, far from the busy ways of men. I sit down alone. Only God is here. In His presence I open. I read His book for this end to find the way to heaven. Teach them the sacred writings. That's an impressive, that's an impressive view by John Wesley right there. Then for Paul to tell Timothy of the things he learned and had been convinced of, the authority in those different ways, apostolic, pastoral, parental, for the sacred writings. Then there's also this idea of sincerity. It would be easy for Timothy to dismiss maybe the things that Paul taught, except for the sincerity in his life as you look at his example and his conduct, in his persecutions and sufferings, he brings those things out. He says, you followed my persecutions and sufferings as well. That makes you kind of wonder, well, that sounds kind of egotistical again. Here he is, he's highlighting all of these things that he suffered for the cause of Christ. But I think that it, those very sufferings right there added a level of sincerity to what he taught that made it easy for it to pass from teaching to conviction for Timothy. The things that he suffered, the persecutions, they were witnessed by Timothy for one thing because Timothy was a native in the historical account either of Derby or Lystra, one of the cities that are listed right here, cities that were near to each other, and no no doubt he was there at the time that these things occurred because Paul brings them out as though he should know them. And he recounts to Timothy, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. So Timothy would be aware of them. At at Antioch, what happened? It says, when the religious Jews saw the crowds, when the Jews saw the crowds, and they were the religious ones of the day, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken of by Paul and blaspheming. That was the first level of persecution, contradiction. But it went on from there. The Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the men of this, leading the men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. That was Antioch. So here's this persecution starts up against Paul. That's the one he's mentioning here in our text today. It was a violent mob. Drove them right out of town. Iconium in Acts 14, the account. The Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. That's the start of it. And then an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews to mistreat and to stone them. It got worse in Iconium than Antioch. Same group of Jews following around persecuting him. Started out contradicting, embittering, Now they're mistreating them and an attempt was made to stone him. So what about Lystra? Again in chapter 14 of Acts, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul. Dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So they accomplished what they couldn't get done and what just started in Antioch and Iconium and was finally culminated in Paul's being stoned in Lystra and left for dead. Those are the persecutions he's referring to here, to Timothy. He says, you followed these. But he said, the Lord rescued me out of them all. Out of them all, the Lord rescued me. The end of 11. So none of those persecutions, 
in those places resulted in his death. They thought he was dead, but the Lord raised him up and he continued on. Now, notice the human responsibility right here. He says, I endured. And then notice the divine strengthening. Out of them all, the Lord rescued me. So in persecution, here's, here is the, the necessity of, of the believer to endure it. But here is the supply of strength at the time given so that he can endure it. And Paul recounts these. We, we ought to be able to recount and observe deliverances, recall them. He's recalling them to Timothy. Then he says, Godliness is everywhere persecuted. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's none other than what the Lord Himself said that the world loves its own, but because you're not of the world and I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. So that was the Lord's forewarning to the, to the disciples of the day. Persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer it to some extent in some way. Albert Barnes, I read him, and he says this, the essence of persecution is inflicting some injury on him, depriving him of some privilege or right, subjecting him to some disadvantage, or placing him in less favorable circumstances on account of opinions and beliefs. That's persecution. So it's not always being thrown in prison or being tortured or being like Paul, stoned and drug out of town, left for dead, and those kinds of things. Barnes goes on to say this may be either an injury done to his feelings, his family, his reputation, his property, his liberty, his influence, it may be by depriving him of an office which he held, or preventing him from obtaining one to which he's eligible. It may be by subjecting him to a fine, or imprisonment, or to banishment, or torture, or death in its extreme forms. If in any manner or in any way he's subjected to disadvantage on account of his religious opinions and deprived of any immunities and rights to which he would otherwise be entitled, this is persecution. You see, that's a more full description of it. We might call that white-collar persecution in America. Blessed are you when others revile you. You might be reviled and persecute you. Jesus calls that persecution. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Maligned and reviled and slandered. That can be persecution. Persecution arises because the gospel is offensive to pride. And godliness is offensive to the flesh. And so persecution arises. Peter says they're surprised you don't run with them in the same excesses of dissipation. And what do they do? They malign you. That's persecution. Speak bad about you. What did you do? What did I do? Well, you just didn't go in the same direction as them and chase after all the things they were chasing after. That's all you did. And it ends up that they malign you. Persecution can come from enemies of the cross. It can come from other religions. We've seen that. It can come from close family members. Sometimes the members of a person's own family can become enemies. It can come from those in powerful places of influence. You've got a boss, 
You've got a governor, you've got a president, you've got an administration, you've got legislators. All can be sources of persecution for the church, for Christians. And it can come from wolves in the church. People in the church can actually become persecutors of true Christians. Geographically, some places are worse than others. There are places in this world where possession of a Bible, conversion to Christianity in the first place would be a death sentence. Speaking of Christ and converting someone to Christianity would be a death sentence. Geographically. And some eras of time and seasons are worse than others. Peter says you can do right and suffer for it. That's persecution. If you do that patiently, it finds favor with God. And we're blessed if we suffer for the sake of righteousness. Doing what's right and not what's wrong. And we all know there are varying degrees of persecution. But it's a part of the perilous times, I believe, that we're in. And we have no guarantee that it won't come to us in a greater way because verse 13 says, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Evil men in the world, it seems like that's what's being spoken of there. Imposters, that would probably be a church term. Imposters, and they are in a state of steady decline, going from bad to worse. So persecution in the world is never going to be totally eradicated. It's, it might improve for a season in a certain area, a certain time. You know, in the fourth, fourth century, the, the church, the fourth century of the church, Christianity under Constantine became the religion of Rome. So leading up to that and the seasons before, there was such violent persecution against the church, but then there was a season when it became relatively popular, or at least acceptable in some way, open-mindedness under Constantine. So there might be an improved season in a certain area, but overall, evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And all the all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Here's the power of believing a lie, deceiving and being deceived. Goes from bad to worse. A man by the name of Gray said, A man may tell a lie till he believes it to be the truth. And deception is making others believe something to be true and right, which is false and wrong. So there's a level of sincerity in the belief of a lie. And people can be under a delusion that gets worse over time. A delusion, you know, that is described by the dictionary, defined by the dictionary as an impression that is firmly maintained despite reality and rational argument. That's a delusion. So we can believe a lie long enough that it becomes a truth to us. We can deceive as a result of that deception, grow worse in it until it becomes a delusion, and then it's firmly maintained despite reality or rational argument. So continue and follow with conviction. Hold our original confidence firm to the end, says the Hebrews. Writer to the Hebrews, continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast to the Colossians. And be firmly convinced so that by patience and well-doing, 
for glory and honor and immortality in the end he will give eternal life Romans 2 7 so may we like Timothy continue and follow and be firmly convicted in our hearts well that's all I have for this morning